It's the year of the tiger in North Vietnam, one year after the signing of the Paris Peace Agreement. The camouflage that once covered the bicycles and trucks has been put away. The sidewalk bomb shelters have been filled in with dirt, and the children are back in the cities. Somehow these people have driven back the most powerful military force in the world. The anti-aircraft guns still surround the city, but the air raid sirens are silent. Now there's time for rebuilding the country and getting back to the day-to-day -day work life of the city. Peace here in the North has not meant peace in the South. As long as the United States hangs on in South Vietnam, the fighting there will continue. But in North Vietnam, where people have endured seven years of bombing, they finally have a chance to build a new society without the constant pressure of war. What is more natural, Ho Chi Minh wrote, after sorrow comes joy. The American invaders defeated, we will rebuild our country ten times more beautiful. It's hard to imagine what Hanoi must have been like without children. During the bombing, they were evacuated. Their schools were scattered in the countryside, and their classes were sometimes held in caves. These children grew up with war. They all know what to do when they hear an air raid siren. They used to wear heavy straw vests on their way to school in the countryside to protect them from anti-personnel bombs. Now they're back in their old neighborhood school in Hanoi, where the motto is study by playing. These children are learning to comb their hair. After practicing, one boy gave it a try. Twenty years ago, not many Vietnamese could read or write. Ho Chi Minh said that his passionate desire was that the children of Vietnam would have enough to eat, clothes to wear, and could go to school. He called for people to organize literacy campaigns. People who could read found others to teach until the whole country had received a basic education. One class put on traditional costumes and makeup to perform for us in the schoolyard. Đời đời hát ca tên anh những người anh hùng. 
Not everyone who lived in Hanoi could be evacuated during the bombing. Late one night in December 1972, B-52s began to bomb Kam Tien Street. People were sleeping when the first bombs fell, and they woke up to fires, explosions, and shattering walls. Nearly 300 people were killed. children whose parents died that night were adopted by families on the street so they wouldn't have to leave the neighborhood. The people of Kam Tien Street built this monument to those who were killed in the bombing. The December bombing of 1972 was the heaviest of the war. Bac Mai, the largest hospital in North Vietnam, was nearly destroyed. At first, the Pentagon denied that U.S. bombs had ever hit Bac Mai. Then they said it was an accident and the damage was superficial. But foreign journalists in Hanoi who lived through the bombing sent out photographs and gave descriptions of the raid on Bac Mai. Every building was damaged. In the eyes of the world, it became the final proof that the U.S. was deliberately bombing civilian targets in an effort to terrorize the population. The patients were evacuated before the bombing began, but 28 doctors and nurses were killed. It's been difficult for Bach Mai to recover. Slowly, it has taken on more patients, and some medical classes are meeting again. In the Paris Peace Agreement, the United States made a commitment to help pay for the reconstruction of North Vietnam. The U.S. government has never honored its promise. However, some Americans on their own have sent nearly a million dollars to help rebuild Bach Mai through an organization called Medical Aid to Indochina. People from other countries throughout the world have also made contributions, and the rebuilding of Bach Mai is underway. The remains of a textile factory in Nam Dinh, the third largest city in North Vietnam. Bombed under President Johnson, this factory was rebuilt and then destroyed again in bombing ordered by President Nixon. The industry of North Vietnam was never completely destroyed because it was kept small scale and decentralized. Heavy machinery was moved from place to place and camouflaged or set up in shops underground. The bombing made factory work difficult, but never stopped it. If the bombing does not start again, industry can begin to expand. Apartment buildings in Nam Din were also hit. Because new housing cannot be built fast enough to replace bomb buildings, these families must go on living in the ruins of their former homes. <laughs> the Vietnamese are building new housing as fast as they can and hundreds of families are waiting to move into these new apartments as soon as they're ready.
The problem is there's not enough heavy machinery and building materials are scarce. Socialist countries have donated some cranes and bulldozers, but mainly the Vietnamese are on their own. Women on the site were doing every kind of work. During the war, women learned to operate anti-aircraft guns, to speak up at political meetings, and to take over many of the toughest industrial jobs. The Constitution declares that men and women are equal and the law requires equal pay. But the Vietnamese say that women are winning their equality through the sheer strength of their arms. The women's union told us that women will not give up the gains they made during the war, and now men are being asked to share in the work at home. North Vietnam is still a poor country, and the work is backbreaking six days a week. But people here have a sense of purpose. They are building housing for those who lost their homes in the bombing. The workers decide in their work teams how to do their job. They improvised an outdoor factory to make prefab walls for the two-room apartments. Everything is made right on the site. You can tell from the size of the wall that the apartments are small, but they all have running water and electricity. The rents will be no more than 10% of a Vietnamese family income, and there will be daycare and playgrounds nearby. Even if the cities had been completely destroyed, the North Vietnamese say that the resistance would have continued in the countryside. Most Vietnamese work in the rice fields of the Red River Delta. During the bombing, they had to defend themselves against the American planes overhead while working to feed the country. As long as the rice continued to grow, North Vietnam could continue to fight. Under the land reform program, the villages of the Delta became agricultural cooperatives where people work and own the fields together. But some things haven't changed. Water buffalo still pull handmade wooden plows through the mud. The rice fields are divided by a complex web of dikes and dams which control the water level. When the monsoon rains come, everyone in the village wades into the fields to reinforce the dikes, packing them with new mud and straw. If the United States had continued to bomb the dikes, as it did in the last year of the air war, it would have raised the threat of mass starvation. Cooperatives have meant a steady rise in the standard of living. One of the slogans here is, increased pig production in 1974.
Each cooperative makes its own bricks in local kilns, located wherever a patch of red clay can be found. On its own, this co-op has been able to build a nursery school, a meeting hall, and a medical clinic. Now they're expanding the clinic, which is equipped to handle ordinary medical problems, and is run by a doctor and two nurse midwives. Every co-op has a clinic, and all medical care is free. Buddhism is a traditional religion of Vietnam. Although today Buddhism is practiced primarily by older people, the Spring Festival still attracts many Vietnamese who bring incense, fruit, and flowers. Workers can get time off to attend the ceremonies. Buddhism is closely linked to the history of the country. These women are praying at a temple dedicated to the Trung sisters, who led the fight against Chinese invaders in the first century. The government does not interfere with the practice of religion. A Buddhist told us that there need be no conflict between love of God and love of country. On the same street in Hanoi, there is a Catholic church, a Buddhist pagoda, and Nyan Zan, the Communist Party paper. started in Hanoi in 1970 with equipment donated by other socialist countries. It's experimental and it's on just two nights a week. There are about a thousand TV sets in the country, all in public places where people can get together to watch. These songs are performed in a traditional style, but the words are new. The lyrics tell stories about the guerrillas in the south, the hard years of fighting, and about bringing in a good rice crop in spite of the war. This is a special live broadcast on the anniversary of the founding of the Vietnamese Communist Party. watched one night of TV which started with the news, then had a half-hour show called Science Serving the People, another program on maternal health and baby care, an algebra lecture, and a children's puppet show. On Saturday afternoons and Sundays, people relax with their families in parks like this one in Hanoi. This is also the city zoo. The Vietnamese have a special love for children. Families are very close, and while young couples are now encouraged to marry later and have fewer children than their parents did, we were told that if a couple had no children, it would be a disappointment. Because adults work most of the day, children learn to be self-reliant. 
and it's part of Vietnamese family custom that the older brothers and sisters take care of the younger ones. The circus is back in town after evacuation during the bombing. Six nights a week, people crowd into the one-ring tent. It's so popular, it's hard to get tickets. Before the revolution, Vietnamese women were not allowed to go to public events at night. But today, women go out to everything from political meetings to the theater and the circus. Thirty years ago, in this remote mountain area, not far from the border with China, Ho Chi Minh organized the resistance against the French, the first guerrillas of the Viet Minh. They began with 14 rifles and 34 people. The youngest was a 14-year-old girl. Today, she is vice governor of the province. The people of this village protected and fed the guerrillas, and they were among the first to join the resistance. Hiding from the French in a cave nearby, Ho Chi Minh wrote, 
With our bare hands, we are building a country. The French turned this village into a plantation, forcing people to grow jute and rubber for export. Jute and rubber earned profits for the French, but they didn't feed the people of Viet Bac, and famine often swept the province. In 1945, two million people died of starvation in North Vietnam. Today there are no more landlords. The village is the cooperative, and there is more than enough rice for everyone. This house on poles belongs to a family of the Thai minority one of the many ethnic groups who live in the mountains. From the start, the Viet Minh guerrillas worked to unite these different groups into one independence movement, one nation. They were successful. Led by the Viet Minh, the united minorities drove the French out of the mountains, and the Viet Bac region became the first free territory in Vietnam. Once the French were gone, life in this village changed the old taxes were abolished, the land was redistributed, and for the first time, people were working for themselves. The peasants keep their rifles stacked close by where they're working. They have used their rifles to defeat the French and the Japanese, and they would use them again to defend what they have gained. Foreign countries that have invaded Vietnam have always found themselves fighting not only the regular Vietnamese army, but also the people of every small village in the countryside. Another change in this village is daycare. This young teacher takes care of the children who cannot be watched during the day by grandparents. This was the smallest daycare center we saw but in this village it was considered a real advance. Children from all the ethnic groups play together here, and later they will learn to read and write in their own dialects, as well as in the national Vietnamese language. There have been other changes for the minorities in the mountains. These dancers and musicians live together and rehearse in a mountain village. This is a work day for them. They're practicing a traditional Vietnamese folk dance. The French tried to replace Vietnamese culture with their own, 
cutting people off from their past and tearing away their national identity. Vietnamese music became part of the resistance itself. Now all over North Vietnam, there is a revival of classical Vietnamese music and dance and the special cultures of each minority group. Even under the bombing, these musicians traveled by bus to nearby villages to play their traditional instruments. Their slogan was, let our singing drown out the bombs. There's also a new agricultural university in the mountains, where students work on the problems that face village farmers. A thousand students from the different minorities go to school here. They were nominated by their village cooperatives to go to the university, where the state pays for their education. Most of them will go home to their villages when they graduate to bring back what they've learned. The courses are heavy on science and experimentation. The students also work on experimental projects, like these tea fields, trying to find out what plants will grow well in the mountain soil. What they're trying to do is take a region that was exploited and left underdeveloped by the French and turn it into a self-sufficient province that can even begin exporting crops like tea to the rest of the country. In Hanoi, Premier Pham Van Dong and 300 delegates attended the opening session of North Vietnam's most important legislative body, the National Assembly. Delegates are elected from villages and factories around the country, and they are meeting to discuss and approve economic and political goals for the next year. The opening speech talked about the repair of bomb damage and emphasized the seriousness of the fighting in South Vietnam. The delegates pledged continued economic and military aid to the provisional revolutionary government to help them defend their territory in South Vietnam. During a break in the opening session, Trung Chin, president of the National Assembly and a top leader in the Communist Party, talked with friends and delegates and met with the press. 
This woman, Dong Ti Ta, is a delegate from a textile factory in Nam Din. She is well known for having shot down an American plane. This B-52 was shot down over Hanoi. The Vietnamese carefully gathered up the remains of the plane and put them on display inside this cage. Families that visit the zoo on weekend afternoons now walk by and look at the pile of metal that once was the most feared bomber in the U.S. Air Force. but the PRG and the people of Dong Ha would prefer peace. Hãy subscribe cho kênh Ghiền Mì Gõ Để không bỏ lỡ những video hấp dẫn 